My name is John Beck, and it's my pleasure to uh, be connected to the MSU Honors College. And uh, tonight I'm taking over for Dean uh, Cynthia uh, Jackson Elmore, who is unfortunately uh, feeling a little under the weather and not able to moderate this discussion tonight. So it falls to me, and uh, uh, it's really my absolute pleasure because I'm working up here uh, tonight with four fabulous uh, professors here at Michigan State University. Tonight, you are attending the latest in our series of transdisciplinary discussions of really big topics. Tonight, we are talking about being Russia, the past, present, and future of a superpower. I am uh, helped tonight not only uh, by this wonderful panel that I'll introduce in a second, but by uh, Stephanie Cepak, who's going to be running the microphone out in the uh, audience when we take questions, and Claire Wismer. And I'd like to also welcome our audience that uh, catches the live stream of this event, which is done via our friends from uh, the MSU Alumni Association. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce tonight's panel. And uh, let me talk for two seconds about how this is going to work. I'm going to introduce from right to left uh, the four members of the panel. Then the first one I've introduced, Dr. Lisa Cook, is actually going to do her presentation, followed by Matt Polly, followed by Kyle Everett, followed by uh, Sherm Garnett. And we're not going to be taking questions at that point. Instead, what we're going to do is first start with cross-discussion across the panel, just in terms of uh, building on uh, each other's presentations, remarks that they might uh, want to, to highlight. Then we're going to open it up to you, our audience, in terms of uh, your uh, questions and comments about what we've uh, got going on tonight. One thing that I would mention is that uh, far in advance, you know, the things that you don't think about, we did not plan this in relation to the anniversary of the 1917 Russian Revolution, but it just so happens it worked out perfectly that we picked an October date for this, uh, for this uh, specific uh, panel. But I did call Bob Mueller earlier last week and ask him <laughs> if he would please uh, release uh, some form of uh, indictment this morning in the hope that it would uh, spur our uh, audience tonight. So starting on my right, uh, Lisa Cook is an Associate Professor of Economics in the Department of Economics and Associate Professor of International Relations in James Madison College. She's an econo uh, economist primarily interested in macroeconomics, development economics, and economic history. Cook also studies the economics of innovation and financial institutions and crises, including czarist, Soviet, and post-Soviet behavior of inventors in the territory that was once the Soviet Union. Prior to teaching uh, here at MSU, Cook served as senior advisor on finance and development in the U.S. Department of Treasury. She earned her doctorate from the University of California at Berkeley. Immediately on my right, Matthew Pauley is an assistant professor in the Department of History. Associate, associate sorry, associate professor. We just That's gave. Tenure, please. Yeah, really. Thank God. Uh, Pauley was a U.S. Department of State Fasco Fellow at the American Embassy in Kiev, Ukraine, prior to coming here to teach. He is the author of Breaking the Tongue: Language, Education, and Power in Soviet Ukraine, as well as numerous articles, essays, and reviews on early Soviet nationalities policy and the intersection between national identity, education, and childhood in late imperial Russia and the Soviet Union. At MSU, he's a core faculty member of the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies and the Peace and Justice Studies group. He earned his doctorate from Indiana University. On my immediate left, Kyle Everett is an associate professor in the Department of Geography, Environment, and Spatial Sciences. Trained to study geographies of the Middle East and North Africa and the former Soviet states of Eurasia, most of Everett's research deals with topics associated with the geographies of Turkey and its neighboring states. In particular, he has published on the cultural and historical geographies, political geographies, and cultural ecologies of the country and its wider regions. He earned his doctorate from the University of Oregon. 
Sherman Garnett, uh, and uh, our last uh, professor on my far left, is a professor and dean of the James Madison College here on campus. His interests include the former Soviet Union, especially Russian foreign and security policy, Ukraine and comparative political and security issues for the post-communist world. He was most recently a senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where he directed projects on security and national identity in the former USSR and Russian-Chinese relations. Before that, he worked for more than a dozen years on arms control and post-communist security policy questions in a variety of positions in the U.S. government, finishing his government service as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia. He earned his doctorate from the University of Michigan. Just one quick parenthetical note about Sherm. He happens to be probably the best read in Russian literature of probably any arms control expert in the history of the United States, since that's... All that big of a <laughs> <laughs> I think it's wonderful, but we'll, uh, we'll find out maybe more about that later. But at this point, let me turn it over to Dr. Cook to start off our panel tonight. Oh, on the bottom? On the bottom. Is it on? So thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this important and timely topic. So my perspective on being Russia, the past, present, and future of a superpower is going to be mainly economic. And I'm just going to add a little bit to what John said because this colors how I think about the Russian economy and Russia's international economic relations. So when I was in the Obama administration at the Council of Economic Advisors from 2011 to 2012, I worked on the Law of the Sea Treaty. And this is one that is governing uh, the way in which claims are being laid to the Arctic region. And again, I see this through an economic lens. I also worked on the Eurozone uh, and the European Union is an important part of the economic picture that is painted with respect to Russia. So the first thing I'd like to do is give you a refresher on the size and the importance of the Russian economy. Because this, this waning superpower, I think, or superpower as it is, uh, I think has to do a lot with the economy. I wrote my dissertation on the Russian banking system in the Tsarist and post-Soviet period. As was said before, I lived there in 1995 and 1996 in, in Moscow. So just as a refresher with respect to the Russian economy, it is not a large economy like the U.S. It's not one of the top three economies in the world. It is a 1.6 or 2.0 trillion dollar economy. Now compare that to the 18 trillion dollar economy of the U.S. So it's a fairly uh, small economy. With respect to GDP per capita, in 2014 it was 11 uh, 1,500, roughly $500, and it had fallen to roughly $11,000 in 2015. The unemployment rate is fairly low. Uh, five point, the official uh, recorded uh, unemployment rate is fairly low. It's 5.2% in 2014 and 5.3% on average in 2016. One thing that has changed quite a bit in Russia is the imposition of uh, sanctions by the EU and the US has changed the economy in a way that has led to decline and led to decline with respect to most of the metrics that macroeconomists like me pay attention to like uh, GDP or let's start with FDI because that would be the most sensitive to changes in the Russian economy or Russian outlook um, this represented, the inflows represented 1.07% of GDP in 2014 and in 2015, it was half that. It was 0.5% uh, of GDP. So sanctions were imposed in 2012 and then again in 2014, again in 2016 due to interference in our uh, elections. Capital flight, a real uh, marker of how, uh, how sustainable 
investors think an economy is, domestic investors in particular, it was $1.5 trillion in uh, 2014. It's uh, fallen quite dramatically. Uh, some would argue that because of sanctions, there was an immediate uh, outflow of, of roughly $1.5 trillion, and in 2016, it was $10.5 uh, billion. Uh, I want to remind you of the structure of the Russian economy. It is heavily dependent on oil. It has been heavily dependent on oil. This has been its main export since 1988. So it's not new that oil and gas are really, or natural resources, are really important to the Russian economy. So uh, it, energy subsidizes the rest of the economy. So if you look at the price of oil, uh, this follows very directly the uh, change in real GDP. So let's see, oil export revenue constitute 20, constitutes 26.6 percent of total revenue from uh, Russian exports and exports constitute about 30% of GDP, so it's large. So who has exposure to the Russian economy? So it's a fairly small economy. It's not uh, one that we're as exposed to as the European Union is, and as the, uh, the economies of the, the Commonwealth of Independent States, the former uh, Soviet Union, and those in the Eastern Bloc. So Ukraine is one that is heavily dependent on uh, the Russian economy and uh, Eastern Europe more generally, more broadly, beyond the CIS. So for the US, there is little dependence. Uh, for the EU, there is more than uh, for the US, but less than for the uh, countries of uh, the CIS. So there are some structural problems that uh, I noticed and many people noticed in the 1990s when I was working on my dissertation that have not been resolved. So luckily for uh, Russia, the price of oil has remained high enough that these structural changes didn't need to be uh, made and they weren't made and they were postponed. And it has subsidized the rest of the economy. It's continued to subsidize the rest of the economy. So these, uh, these fundamental changes have not uh, been undertaken. So they have to do with property rights, they have to do with the quality of infrastructure, of, of roads, of buildings. And uh, part of this feeds into the perception of corruption. So when, when I'm in Russia and I'm working on innovation, the biggest question that I get is why doesn't an investment culture, an investment in innovation culture exist in Russia yet? And that's because, uh, thank you. That's because this is perceived to be uh, a very bad place to invest. Your intellectual property uh, will be stolen. So that's a common perception. It is near the bottom between Nicaragua, Ukraine, and Angola. So, uh, so that's not, that, that doesn't inspire confidence. So I'll skip ahead and I'll say just a bit about uh, the future that, uh, that there, there are two groups uh, see. Uh, people the Russian people and Putin. So people are worried about stagnant and declining living standards. They're worried about the rupture of the social compact. That means that they will call for no more democracy as long as living standards are growing or at least not <coughs> declining. So Putin's worries uh, are similar to that. Uh, he is worried about declining oil revenues, he's worried about declining GDP and declining living standards, and he's worried about challenges to his power. So civil unrest due to the rupture of the social compact and calls for more democracy. So uh, in terms of his economic future, what he sees is continuing to fight the magnificent uh, I can't say it because I have a cold today. Magnitsky Act, uh, whether in the United States, it was passed in 2012 in the United States, and this put sanctions on individual government officials, uh, US sanctions on individual uh, government <laughs> officials. It was just passed in Canada. Uh, he's worried about continuing to lay claim in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, again, he estimates 
that the natural resources there are worth $31 trillion. So he is considering this part of an economic strategy that will renew its status as a world power. And then, um, on my last point, um, for artificial intelligence. He sees this as a central feature, not just of uh, the superpower that is uh, contained in weapons, but also that spills over into civilian use. So we'll say more about this, I think, in the uh, discussion. Thank you. Dobie Petro, Shonovni. I'd like to thank Professor Beck for inviting a historian tonight. It's always dangerous for historians to comment on contemporary events. We're a bit verbose. We like to go into some detail, uh, so I'll try to keep my comments limited. Uh, this is my slideshow. I wonder who's been to Kiev? Has anybody ever been to Kiev? <laughs> so, gonna, so this is Kiev, or Kiev in Ukraine, and this is a monument to, you, uh, to the unification of Russia and Ukraine, constructed in 1982. It stands beneath what is car called in Ukrainian Ark Druzhba Narodiv, that is the Ark of the Friendship of Peoples. They don't know quite what to do with it right now, uh, given uh, Ukrainians' difficulties with Russia. Uh, it has been uh, colored, uh, the colors of gay pride. Uh, it has been featured as a sort of cultural event for the city, city, of, uh, city of Kiev. So, uh, a, a monument that has less bearing on, uh, on contemporary relations when friendship between Russia and Ukraine doesn't really exist, uh, at least in any real formal sense. So, I'd like to remind you all of, of how the Soviet Union was constituted, and a reminder, really, that the current map of Eurasia was produced by the nominally federal system of the Soviet Union, the Russian Republic, featured in pink, obviously occupies the ma vast majority of this map. Uh, and uh, ethnic Russians uh, were uh, the dominant majority in the Soviet Union, constituting slightly over 50% of the population of the Soviet Union. Ukraine, its adversary in the current age, uh, is pictured in yellow, a much smaller republic, uh, but was still key, I'd submit to you, for economic, strategic, and historical reasons. So in regards to Russia's current ambitions vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, it is history that perhaps matters most. Ukraine and Russia both lay claim to Kiev as the historical center of their respective nations. And uh, Russia presents Ukraine as linked to Russia from time immemorial. I submit to you that uh, it has not been. In fact, Ukraine wasn't really directly controlled by Russia into the latter part of the 18th century. After 1991, Russia has consistently sought to rectify what Vladimir Putin has famously called the greatest geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century, that is the collapse of the Soviet Union, by instigating or abetting regional disputes that work towards uh, Russia's interests. Uh, so this is a map of so-called frozen conflicts in the post-Soviet space. There's differences to be between these conflicts, to be sure, uh, and some of them are anything but frozen. Uh, certainly what is going on in southeastern Ukraine, I would submit to you, is not uh, frozen in spite of its, uh, in spite of less talk about it in the American, the American press. Um, So in 2014, Russia acted against Ukraine in order to regain what it had secured without military involvement before. Through its patronage of the Ukrainian president, Viktor Yanukovych, who is featured in the news today, it, has, uh, it has succeeded in creating a hollow state that privileged an economic and strategic relationship with Russia. Uh, I'd argue to you that uh, if uh, Viktor Yanukovych had not been overthrown by public demonstrations in Ukraine, uh, Russia would have had little reason to annex Crimea and to foment a separatist rebellion in southeastern uh, Ukraine in the, uh, in the oblasts of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. Uh, 
it has sought to justify its actions against Ukraine uh, since 2014 by a multitude of reasons, but foremost among them were its defense of the rights of Russian-speaking Ukrainians and ethnic Ukrainians. And a brief gesture towards that topic, my particular interest historically is um, the status of the Ukrainian language. Uh, but uh, I'd uh, suggest to you that when the conflict first began, the American media started abetting this idea of a divided Ukraine by projecting maps such as this, uh, which suggested that the political affiliations of Ukrainians were determined by which languages, uh, which language they spoke, uh, when that wasn't the case in my view. All right. Uh, Russian, uh, so we're going to linger on this slide for a while. This is uh, Ukrainian propaganda, right? Uh, it's, it's updated regularly. It's uh, from the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense's uh, information site, uh, which is publicly accessible. It's published in English purposefully for you to view and for you to understand the duress that the Ukrainian state has been under by uh, Russian supported separatists. So Russian actions against Ukraine precipitated, precipitated a larger campaign to destabilize and undermine the legitimacy of the West through its meddling in the electoral systems of France, Germany, and famously for us, the United States. And so doing, this overhanded strategy has laid bare to you, to you and to the American public, I'd say, an adversarial relationship that no one in the West really wanted, least of all the Obama administration. It has stiffened American and European resolve and support uh, for Ukraine and a sanctions regime that might have otherwise fractured uh, if it wasn't so apparent uh, uh, if Russian involvement in, uh, in an, our own political uh, system hadn't been so apparent. In Ukraine, Russian action has galvanized national unity among a population that was divided in its orientation and generally looked favorably on Russians right, uh, if not the Russian government. Ukrainian prospective membership in NATO raised the ghost of a Cold War era and served as a bitter reminder of Russia's failure to prevent NATO expansion in East Central Europe and the Baltic states in 1919, 1999 and 2004. Still, uh, I'd argue to Ukrainian membership in NATO has never really been on the table. NATO really never really wanted uh, Ukraine as a member and opinion in Ukraine is still evenly divided. Uh, about a prospective membership in NATO in spite uh, of the reality of uh, war on its uh, eastern border with Russia. It depends on which poll you look at, um, but uh, it's, it's perhaps slightly more than 50% in favor of Ukrainian membership in NATO. All right, lastly, there was undoubtedly uh, support uh, among some Ukrainians for the rejection of the Maidan, that is the pro-EU, for lack of a better term, uh, uh, pro-EU demonstrations that took place in the Maidan Nizhelesnosti, uh, the uh, independent square. But the war in southeastern Ukraine would not have occurred without Russian military involvement. Russia has failed to truly cover up the extent of this involvement, even if we do not believe everything that is featured on maps such as this, right? If we don't believe all of the Ukrainian military propaganda, uh, uh, propaganda's message about Russian military activities. Russian military involvement uh, continues to this day. For example, in this year, Russian provision artillery played a key role in a renewed separatist offensive around the city of Avdivka in February uh, of this year. Russia, I'd submit to you, to return to my opening comments, unlike the West, will remain singularly focused on realizing its aims in Ukraine and in what Russia views as the near abroad uh, because of its conviction that it's righting a historical wrong, right? And this is where history to me matters. American protests about the sanctity of international law and the violations of international law matter little to Russians in the face of this determinism. Thank you. Hello. Is that on? You're right. Why don't you do that no, one? I'll There's switch with you. Okay. You dropped it in rehearsal too many times. I think, okay. Okay. Either one. There we go. Yeah. Um, 
the, the work that I do does not look at Russia directly. I, I, I feel like I need to say that when I'm on this, this panel with the other people. Um, that said, uh, I am highly educated. I know words, <laughs> and I use the best words. Um, but when we are, are, are thinking about Russia, a lot of what I have done has, has been essentially kind of under the, the shadow of Russia. Uh, in one way or another, when we think about the, the rise of modern Turkey in the 20th century and continuing up to the present, and even if uh, we go before that time, too. Now, as a, a geographer, uh, I, I sometimes, uh, oftentimes, suffer from, uh, you know, kind of not setting up barriers in terms of uh, the, the, the subject matter that I look at, the uh, uh, different uh, fields uh, that I look at, because you can kind of get away with uh, doing everything uh, sometimes, but uh, when, when we're thinking about uh, what geography has to tell us, a lot of uh, the, the relationships between uh, Turkey and Russia can also tell us quite a bit uh, about Russia itself uh, in addition to, to Turkey. And I think when we look at it, it's a very particular relationship as well. Uh, there, there are common histories that are shared. Uh, if we think about it, uh, the, the question of where Turkey is, where Russia is, uh, have occupied some of the major kind of geopolitical uh, big questions of the last 200 years, uh, perhaps. Uh, there are also conflicting claims uh, over time that are uh, not resolved, won't be resolved anytime soon. We can think about this as well uh, very much in terms of uh, shifting priorities in the context of the collapse of the Soviet Union and what came afterwards. Uh, and more recently, uh, we, we oftentimes see this presented as uh, a, a sort of, you know, a, a question of, of Putin and Erdogan, um, much like the sort of bromance that, uh, between Trump and, and uh, Putin. Um, this is something that, that kind of surfaces occasionally, uh, or not infrequently, as well. One of the things that I'll, I'll note, though, is that you have very common interests and common uh, economies, though, that I, I think really should make us take a sort of, uh, uh, you know, very practical view of politics rather than sometimes going along with the sort of generalizations that we see in the press that are simply about the sort of uh, personal politics of Putin or of Erdogan uh, in either case. Now, the, the field that I draw on mostly when I'm doing work is a field known as critical geopolitics, and it's one that looks at a lot of uh, media representations uh, in no small amount. It also deals with quite a bit what uh, Stephen Colbert referred to as truthiness, not infrequently, <clears throat> in terms of looking at sort of uh, discourses about politics, uh, not just the pronouncements of uh, leaders, uh, of states, of so-called experts, but looking at the sort of things that you see in the media. And, uh, for a fair amount of the work that I do, I sometimes try to draw on popular media uh, as well, uh, as, a, as a way of kind of looking at uh, the, the uh, uh, kind of sentiments that, that you sometimes see uh, about issues as well. Now, if we're talking about Turkey and Russia, um, although one of the things that I'll be talking about has more bearing to the, the, the handshake that we, we see here maybe uh, than the sort of conflict uh, that uh, is illustrated uh, from the uh, late 19th century, uh, you, you've seen the conflict uh, depicted more often than not uh, in a lot of histories, in, in a lot of political uh, commentaries. Going back to the time when, when Turkey uh, took uh, Istanbul or Constantinople, uh, going through the many Russo-Turkish wars, um, culminating particularly with uh, uh, the one that uh, we had in the, the late 1870s, um, which was only, you know, uh, uh, one of... Uh, probably 10 to 12 at least, uh, depending on how we're counting uh, the, 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 these uh, contestations. And then thinking about it <clears throat> up through uh, the present day, uh, again, whether we're thinking about the great game uh, or whether we're thinking about the sort of Heartland thesis, uh, McKinder's question, sort of uh, concerns uh, echoed by the, the West about a, a so-called sick man of Europe, or the enduring straits questions, uh, or uh, Cold War uh, issues, and, and we uh, recognize that Turkey was uh, ground zero for 
the Cold War, when we think about the uh, articulation of the Truman Doctrine, which was written uh, essentially to uh, protect uh, Turkey and Greece, uh, also Iran indirectly, but uh, it's been at the center uh, in, in many respects, whether recognized uh, or not. This sort of uh, relationship, though, uh, is one that I think uh, oftentimes is, is not examined enough and oftentimes uh, undervalued in many ways. If we start to move into thinking about uh, modern Turkey during the, the Cold War period, we obviously think about uh, once uh, Stalin started to, to demand the Straits, uh, you know, at Potsdam uh, and, and thereafter, uh, Turkey moved well within the West's uh, sphere of uh, influence and particularly was uh, one of the most valued members of NATO. Uh, was uh, second only to the United States in terms of uh, per capita uh, contribution to NATO and in terms of uh, per capita uh, troops provided to NATO uh, as well throughout much of NATO's history uh, when, when Turkey was a member. If you look at the map of Turkey, uh, as you can see here in the upper uh, corner, there's no shortage of Western bases uh, within the country. We oftentimes think of Injerlik, but there are quite a few others uh, as well. Now, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, we ended up seeing Turkey being on the outs uh, with uh, the West all of a sudden, uh, shifting from a, a great friend to somebody that maybe we don't want to recognize too much. And, and that sort of uh, changing uh, uh, alignment between the West and Turkey, Turkey started to look increasingly eastward, and particularly at the uh, uh, states of the former Soviet Union and at particular populations within uh, Russia and other uh, republics as well. When we think about that, they started to deploy their own kind of cartographies. Uh, and, and you can see an example here of the kind of map that they started to deploy in the early 90s, uh, looking at what they referred to as a Turk Dunyasa, a Turkic world. Uh, indicating both sort of sister states that they had, places like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, which are Turkic, uh, but also the many populations uh, that are uh, Turkic-speaking peoples. Now, they didn't do this in a way that would be provocative to Russia, uh, unlike uh, what we had just heard uh, from Matt discussing uh, Russia's uh, engagement uh, within uh, post-Soviet states and uh, trying to stir up uh, foment uh, problems uh, in those contexts. These two states uh, instead became increasingly uh, interconnected in many ways. Almost overnight you started to have uh, exchanges between these states, lots of uh, Russians starting to, to, to go into Turkey, uh, initially just uh, to trade a little bit in the Black Sea coast region, but very quickly becoming major consumers in Turkey. What were they consumers of? Turkey itself. Uh, the tourist industry within Turkey became largely dependent in some spheres upon Russian uh, peoples as well as other peoples from uh, states of the former Soviet Union. Some of the, 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 uh, of the limited experiences that I have uh, in Russia and then in Central Asia, it's one of the things that I notice all the time uh, from the, the mid-90s up to the present, uh, tourism posters advertising uh, destinations in southern, southern Turkey, uh, particularly Antalya. We see major exchanges of food, Turkey buying wheat uh, and uh, Russia buying many other commodities. The exchange uh, of energy products, Turkey is second only to Germany as an importer of Russian natural gas. And uh, when we're looking at this relationship, it's one that had largely gone <coughs> on uh, very well. It, it, almost no matter where you would go, whether it's in Russia or uh, any of the other post-Soviet states, probably with the exception of the, the Baltics. Uh, you would run into all kinds of construction in many of the cities too. Not infrequently those construction sites were being operated by Turkish construction companies, uh, Turkish workers, oftentimes uh, lower end workers from places like Tajikistan and elsewhere uh, as well. Well, you had a plane uh, sh shot down in November uh, 2015 though, you started to have a rupture in uh, relations. That was to some extent um, encouraged even or facilitated, uh, I would argue, when uh, Obama uh, refused to see uh, Erdogan was coming off of the uh, uh, you know, uh, problems of Geze Park, uh, the, the sort of divide with Gulen uh, and whatnot uh, following 2013. In Russia, this became fodder for political commentators. 
uh, the, the, the seeking out of an apology. And finally, uh, although the plane was shot down in November 2015, Erdogan finally apologized in June of 2016. Turkish tourism industry uh, had suffered by about 50% to 60% by that time. Uh, and he, he was mobilizing very rapidly to start getting people back. You can see in the uh, uh, example here, you know, uh, can you can ask him if he brought tourists? Uh, his uh, uh, asking Erdogan. These kinds of uh, relationships then are, again, ones that we think about as, as sometimes being characterized as the sort of friendship of uh, uh, individuals that uh, are uh, dictators or dictator-like, uh, ones that uh, we can associate with uh, our own uh, country and uh, associated depictions uh, as well. But they're also ones that I think in many regards uh, defy certain uh, practicalities. As soon as Erdogan did make that apology, despite the fact that you had uh, a Russian ambassador assassinated uh, in Ankara uh, in uh, late 2016, in December 19th, I think it was, 2016, that was barely a ripple in Turkish-Russian relations. The mutual need of each other uh, for uh, buying each other's uh, goods, commodities, receiving each other's uh, peoples is such that uh, Russia has a very permanent place in Turkey, and Turkey has a very permanent place within Russia, or at least in the Russian economy. Uh, this is an example of one of the Russian-friendly tourist sites, someplace I can't imagine anybody else going to. Uh, it's the Kremlin Hotel in Antalya uh, in southern Turkey. Um, the sort of thing that, again, I think speaks a lot more uh, to, to the uh, sort of practicality of their relationships rather than the sort of uh, uh, characterizations we see in, in the media oftentimes. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> Sorry. No well, um, I'm going to summarize a longer presentation I made to the MSU ROTC. Um, and I told them that they'd probably spend their careers with Russia as a strategic challenger not a superpower, not an ally, not a partner, maybe a major enemy, but not in the way the Soviet Union was. What I believe Russia has done is chosen the stance of being a dissatisfied assertive power. And so I want to sort of sketch briefly what I think that means. So we've heard already that in the last decade, Russia's used military force to occupy a portion of Georgia, 2008, annex Crimea, sustain a military revolt in eastern Ukraine. It's asserted itself into Syria, interfered in Dutch, French, German, and our own elections, and taken up an assertive posture in the Arctic, anticipating for the coming struggle that will take place for the region's resources. It's undertaken new diplomatic initiatives and arms sales and expressions of solidarity with Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and elsewhere. It's spent a lot more money on its military, which went into a precipitous decline when the Soviet Union fell apart. I can talk in excruciating detail about that because I was part of the conventional forces negotiations. Um, fostered very close ties with China. And then there's a bunch of speeches and stuff like that in which they lay out their special interests, their desire to return as a great power, one particularly in 2007, when, which Putin delivered in Munich, which I think is almost the fulcrum for the last 10 years, 12 years. So this happens at the same time that they've retrenched internally, settling into an oligarchic system that features the domination of Putin and an inner circle and some business elites and his party. And this regime has the usual features. Um, hollowed out set of opposition parties. In fact, Putin mused the other couple of weeks ago, wouldn't it be nice to run against a woman and now there are two women running against him? Uh, I, I, I don't see this as real opposition. Uh, there's a largely controlled media managed elections, not the full uh, suppression of speech or dissent, but not nice, a variety of administrative and police measures. Um, nationalistic and cultural conservatism. There was a great article in the Washington Post a few weeks ago about how the right in the United States is especially attracted to Russia because of its stand on LGBT issues and Christian conservatism. Go. Um, 
this Russian oligarchy controls probably half the wealth of the country. So when you look at things like what they're spending on the Olympics or what they're spending on military, you have to understand there's sort of a tax in that. So you can't just say, oh, they're spending twice as much, they must be getting twice uh, as good. They're not. Um, and as Lisa said, the country, the economy is over-reliant on natural resources and corruption and those sorts of things. So to me, these internal and external policies are interrelated. Patriotic appeals, return to major power status, in some ways compensates for uh, the deal that many Russians are living. The Nobel Prize winning writer Svetlana Alexeyevich last year said, in the West, people demonize Putin. Putin. They do not understand that there's a collective Putin consisting of some millions of people who do not want to be humiliated by the West. There is a little piece of Putin in everyone. So let me, let me say, uh, Kyle already talked, I think, about a whole bunch of fancy geopolitical stuff to, that, that, that I have to think about a little bit. But, but in the last 30 years, what's happened is instead of a, a giant chunk of the world in which the center of it is Moscow pushing out and controlling and, and um, essentially limiting access from the outside, you've had a collapse of that center in an attempt to rebuild it. Uh, so a very strange change at the center. You've had the rise of 14 other new states, potentially weak, around the border. These are states that, that don't see themselves in any particular relationship to one another, especially if they're far away. But Russia looks, like, looks at them as a unified whole. And then all the people of the outside world, the cultural stuff, the military, politics, foreign countries, uh, uh, different religious groups, are now entering into this closed space. And so that's a position Russia doesn't like. So let me sum up, you know, there's probably nine points here of the military and foreign policy of Russia. One, Russia sees itself as a great power, significant global actor, even if it can't quite be right now, and will make every effort within the constraints of the economy and the distribution of wealth to the oligarchy to rebuild its leverage. Two, Russia has said from the very beginning, even under Yeltsin, that it has special interests in its neighborhood, defined as the former USSR. It's, it's acting to make sure that interest is protected. Moscow has described different ways of redrawing the uni European security architecture so that there's a Russian sphere and a um, Western sphere covered by NATO and the EU. It's acted very um, strongly in Ukraine to create that sphere. It split NATO and EU members wherever possible, likes to renationalize issues and undermine Western confidence in its political and diplomatic structures. We didn't help by expanding the alliance and in a way the Russians now look back on the 90s as a period where we took advantage of them. Three, West, <laughs> Russia sees Westernization, especially Americanization, um, in geopolitical terms, as a competition for power and influence. It wants to sow seeds of dissension in the West and undermine confidence in democratic regimes. It's done that fairly well. Uh, four, Russia has tried to be a visible leader of a coalition of states that want to encourage multipolar tendencies. Um, China, BRIC countries, Shanghai Cooperation Council. Russia has to swallow junior partner status with, Russia, with China. And I think it's very important when you look at Russia, you need to look at it not only from our end where they're sort of showing their fangs, but also um, that, that cartoon you had where the dog had the tail between its legs. I think that's Russia's stance towards China. At bottom five, Russia's a dissatisfied power with grievances toward the status quo. It's shown it most strongly towards us, but you can look at its posture everywhere. In fact, it's assertive, this is point six, under special circumstances or in ways that signal a resistance but don't take us on face to face. The Syrian case is the most important example of that. Obama declared a red line, decided there wasn't a red line, we didn't want to get in, they got in. So where we're wishy-washy, they're strong. So you can, or they're trying to be strong. That's not the same as saying they're ready to be like the Cold War Russia. Um, 
Russia has adopted a strategy of opposition that involves military improvements, cyber warfare, political information, information warfare. We can talk about so-called hybrid warfare if you want. But the important thing about that is they tend to see, since they see these things as related, they tend to see our actions as somehow related. So we interfered with Ukraine in a strategic way, not that we helped, um, you know, NGOs helped Ukrainian parties or businessmen went over and did investments. That's a unified action taken by America against Russia. Nine, um, if I skipped one, eight. Uh, potential troubles internally could cause further foreign policy gambits. Nine, Russia has not to date undertaken a full-scale rearmament and deployment in any way that resembles the Cold War. That's really important and we can come back to that. The rhetoric seems to be the same. The actual military facts, I would argue, are quite different. Ten, Russia, and this is the final one and I want to say two things about the United States. Russia seems to see the U.S. as a superior power but one without the will, strategy, or persistence to thwart it. Putin derides the U.S. as a hyperpower, but thinks of the U.S. as an ineffective adversary. And such an attitude predates the election of Donald Trump. So let me say a few things about that. We're in a moment of really great uncertainty about our own stance. The old options of the Cold War, which kind of began as a, in a agreement that there needs to be a certain amount of suspicion about Russia then generated into a more left and right wing. Left wing would be more partnership, right wing would be more containment. But I think these things seem to be in abeyance now. I'm not sure what our policy is. The reasons for minimal cooperation like nuclear weapons and the threat of terrorism remain, but we're not doing anything. And into this marches a very unfamiliar stance of the Trump administration, which I think is quite unprecedented. We're silent about Russian interference in our own elections. Ukraine, Russian development of a, de of a nuclear missile that violates the INF Treaty, pretty much everything. Trump, President Trump has str shown a kind of indifference to our allies and a fascination with regimes <coughs> run by strongmen. Yet he doesn't have enough trust from the American population to move in any new direction. I understand that the president thinks that the election and Russian interference carries with it the potential link that this proves collusion. I think he's making a huge mistake to be silent about Russian interference in our elections. It's unsettling and it's just going to invite more. And if you think it's always going to be on the Republican side, they're just dead wrong. I think because. At bottom, what Russia wants to do is to make everybody think that internal politics or external politics are just power. Rich people doing power. No human rights, that's all a game. No economic development, that's a game. Russia wins with that. They don't have to pick their candidate. They just have to let us think that our system is no good or is just a, a, a mask. Nationalistic and America first doctrines made former certainties uncertain. I just don't know what our interests are in this environment. The president's weakness and distraction make creative diplomacy in this area very unlikely anytime soon because he's too weak to do something new and the dominant mode is a kind of hyper suspicion. Um, so there I'm done. Wonderful, first of all, let us give our panel a, a round of applause if you would please. Just a couple of quick comments from me, and then I want to open it up to the panel to comment on each other. We already had a little bit of that going on, but I'd love to hear more, and then we'll open it up to all of you. You know, it's amazing, and I, I can't stress this enough for the young people uh, in the audience, either here or on the, the live stream, what a difference a few years makes. Many of us were raised in the United States where our parents were uh, busy putting aside food and water in the basement uh, in bomb shelters. And we were all taught to duck and cover in our grade schools where we understood that a piece of paper would stop certain particles but not all. You know, and uh, we learned a lot uh, back in those days. How well many of us remember the proxy wars when uh, it was all about Russian involvement on our doorstep uh, through the Cuban Missile Crisis 
and in various places across Latin America and in Africa, the presence of Russian doctors, the presence of Russian troops. And now, what now we've heard across this panel for this former major foil for us as the United States. We've heard from Lisa about economic weakness, doubling down perhaps on one specific extractive industry. They have, I think, others, and we might want to hear more about those later. Are they, as we've already heard up here, are, can they only now be an agent of chaos and kind of a global spoiler rather than necessarily uh, kind of the assertive power that they were at one point? And do they look back wistfully and believe as a, as a nation now that their best years are behind them rather than some type of, of rosy future for more than just uh, the oligarchs? And as uh, I think we began to hear from Sherm, and what about our role, not only in relation to uh, the United States itself, but also, um, and as Kyle raised, really our role within the NATO alliance and, and an entire kind of geopolitical structure that was put together with the Soviet Union at the center of it. If it is now kind of a deflated power, what now uh, becomes uh, that you know, continuing NATO role? So there's a lot of questions up here. Let me first open it to the panel. Do you have any uh, questions or comments for one another or other things that you want to raise before we open it to the audience? Any points? That oh, I just have Lisa? So I, I think that in this deflated role, it can cause problems. It can cause chaos. And I think that's what it's aiming to do. And even in Putin's pronouncements about how important artificial intelligence was going to be to humankind, he is thinking about harnessing the, uh, the efforts of many Russian hackers that are operating legally and illegally. He'll probably never be able to harness the ones who are operating illegally because that would take some sort of you know, imposition of property rights and so on and some sort of incentive for them to behave uh, better. But in this deflated role, I think he's thinking of what he can stop, what kind of chaos he can sow, um, how he might be able to diminish the power of, uh, of adversaries. Uh, whether in the United States or in Ukraine or in France. One of the banks that I studied uh, in my dissertation financed the uh, campaign of Marine Le Pen. So I, I think that that's the overall strategy. And I think that um, the strategy that's being implemented in Ukraine, and I think it can't be understated, there is something else besides uh, profit and strategic maximization going on here. The, the, the gut reaction of Russians that I, that I lived with, with respect to Ukraine, is just unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's something that we, uh, we probably wouldn't understand, but they believe that there's some sort of umbilical cord between Russia and Ukraine. And I think that's, that's something that, that maybe the American press doesn't, or maybe the Western press in general, uh, doesn't get as much. But I think they can, they can do, they can engage in a lot of mischief. They can cause a lot of mischief, and I think that's a goal. Great. Matt? So I don't have a great deal to add to that beyond pointing out and emphasizing what Lisa said as well, that Russia is using vastly modern means to act as an agent uh, of chaos. Um, uh, I don't think it moves from that position w until it feels satisfied that the rest of the world is paying attention to the position that it believes it has earned, right, and accepts it, accepts Russia as an equal partner in uh, negotiations regarding whatever uh, international conflict that, that arises. Um, I would say their criticism is of the West, in particular of the United States, is that the West is moving too fast towards the future, lurching towards the future, and losing sight of its roots in its embrace of sort of a decadent form of secularism um, that Russia, Russia rejects. 
Um, lastly, in regards to Ukraine, and what Lisa said, I fully agree, of course. Uh, uh, um, the basic problem, I think, between Russia and Ukraine is that there is not a recognition of a state called Ukraine, really, in the end, or a recognition of Ukrainian sovereignty. Ukraine is, um, it has a special relationship with Russia, and whether the Ukrainians want to call themselves Ukrainians in a state called Ukraine, and sort of besides the fact, um, it, it is tied, as Lisa quite correctly pointed out, um, irrevocably to Russia. Um, uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. Kyle or Sherm, any other comments from either one of you? Well, I would just say that I don't think it's a diminished power. I think it's a diminished power historically, but compared to the 90s, um, it's coming back. And it's coming back with an agenda of, of being aggrieved. Um, I think it's on the way to redefining its half of the European space. Um, I, I, I guess, uh, from my perspective, it is important for us not to immediately leap back into a, a like a, a Soviet U.S. Cold War position, because I don't think they're the superpower. It's simple, similarly, I would argue that just because the Chinese are declaring themselves uh, to be the power of the future, we shouldn't automatically see that in Soviet terms. As, as Lisa pointed out, we have less economic interest. I don't know if this is still true. I used to say it. Uh, she, she can correct me. But Italy has more economic trade with Russia, at least at one point, than we did. Um, that's not the case with China. It's a much more complicated thing. What I, what I would say is, if you back up, we're in a kind of a period of strategic uncertainty as to what the system is. There's these new populisms, new nationalisms, new whatever. You have uh, the appearance of a set of new means of influence, like the internet and hacking and artificial intelligence and all of that. And it's just very hard to figure out um, where we stand in that. And I think that's been exacerbated by the election of this president. So instead of a bunch of people either from a recognizable tradition of the right or the left and a security establishment and saying, you know, this isn't quite right. What's going on? What do we need to do? We really have a kind of a, I mean, a, a different set of assumptions and even, um, you know, just the way the Korean policy is being carried out or the Russian policy. All of these things are kind of uh, new and different. And it seems to me that it's uncertain where we're headed. Um, I do know already, though, that I agree with the president. I'm tired of winning, uh, very tired of winning. Um, so I think that there's a, there is a need. I think I, I, I can't stress it enough. It's very like the drift in U.S.-Turkish relations, the the indifference to the alliance, the the way the Japanese are looking at changing their constitution, um, and I think it's a smart move for their part because we're not that reliable. I mean, there's a whole set of things that are going on right now that, you know, don't elect a cold warrior to fix it, but somebody who at least had some connection to the past and some sense of the future. And I think we're a, an incredible wild card in this. Okay. Um, now, Stephanie is going to, if you raise your hand, she'll come around. Let me ask uh, one question while she's doing that. Do raise your hands and she'll come to you with the microphone. Uh, one of you mentioned the idea that there's more than one Putin. Putin very well may be much more a mindset and that there could be a variety of Putins. But help us understand, maybe to kick off tonight, what does a post-Putin Russia look like? Or is, will we ever be past Putin or will there simply be more and more Putin-like people that uh, come in his wake? Anyone want to rise to the bait on that one? Well, what, yeah, I'll rise, I don't know. The problem with this system is that it can be, I guess, there could be a successor and there'd be some jostling and you'd get back to trying to pay off people and 
run it this way and, and if they can tap into the Arctic and get their 31 trillion or whatever. I mean, you could see this thing going on even um, uh, though Putin may not be here. But I think there's also a chance that that system fails. Um, and, and it seems to me that that's, uh, it's very hard. I mean, you know, they say no one predicted the fall of the Soviet Union. I think there were a lot of people that felt that there were things going on that were funky. But it was very hard to know that something that apparently solid, even with all of its contradictions, was just going to you know, fall apart as swiftly as it did. And so, as I think Lisa said it very well, that, that if there is this powerful sense of patriotism and that Ukraine belongs to them or Russia's respected on the world that goes far enough if the basic things are, are still there. If that goes down, I think, you see this as, you'll, you'll see some uncertainties and then some, um, I think, uh, instability. The, the, I guess the final point I would make is Putin is using this as manipulatively, uh, like his return to Orthodox Christianity, his uh, puffing up imperial and Soviet heroes and all of that. He doesn't give a damn about that, just not at all. I mean, he, like, he'll, he'll take communion and all of that stuff, but this is, this is for, the bottom and there's a kind of cynicism about it and it can collapse and I think that there's an amazing sense from the elite of uncertainty if these things get out of control so the more politics is staged managed the more it's controlled the more elections go well the more there's one party that appears you know I mean those kinds of things are are reassurances but there's a kind of uncertainty in his system that I think is um, you know, he's not a person right now that wants to pick a successor. So I really think there's a kind of a, like as he gets older and uncertain, you've seen it in Central Asia, you, you've had a tendency towards many of these systems have a, an old autocrat. And Kazakhstan will have to make a transition, Uzbekistan did, Azerbaijan kind of created a hereditary monarchy. Um, you know, you've got these, and Lukashenko has taken over. Putin is trying to do that, but there's a funny passage in Solzhenitsyn's first circle where Stalin, as he's getting older, is thinking about whether his scientists will come up with some sort of immortality. And that's what I think Putin wants in a certain sense. I don't think he sees his, I'm not even aware he has a son, but I don't see, I don't think he sees a successor. And I think that's the uncertainty that you see in this system. There are plenty of people that think they would want to take over Putin's job, but I don't think it's an easy one. Well, John, we have our first question over here. Okay, where are we? Right here. Okay. Hi, my name's Noah. Um, like, as the world uh, seems to be moving towards less dependence on, like, carbon, fuel, and, uh, and like, oil and natural gas, it seems to me that, like, Russia is going to have to make a choice in the near distant future of whether to make major political and economic reforms or to be continued to be marginalized regardless of Western sanctions. My question, I'm just curious what direction you think Russian will go or maybe a mixture of both, I'm not sure. Lisa? So I think that's a, a really good question. I think that a number of oil dependent countries who are forward looking are beginning to invest say in renewable energy, especially in solar power. So this is happening in the Gulf states. So so I think that they 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 have this this realization, but just as Putin doesn't care about the, I'm not going to say the grand strategy, but he seems to be implementing a series of tactics to maintain uh, Russia's economic and uh, strategic power. I think that he's not thinking about the economy this way either, because if you were really thinking about the economy long term, you would have moved away from dependence on oil. You would have moved or more uh, away from dependence on oil. You would have developed human capital. 
You know, it has one of the highest stocks of human capital in the world. And because of this lack of enforcement of property rights, they're all sending us messages and hacking this and hacking that, hacking the DNC, hacking the RNC, you know, and, and, and just doing all these illegal things. And you can imagine a country that has harnessed these amazing resources that are not natural resources. There's, they made a decision to invest in education. And this was a long time ago, and they could reap the benefits from this still. But without property rights protection, all of this is, is, is moot. So I think that they're not thinking about the long term, although they have many of the tools to become a, a real forceful economic power that doesn't rely on, uh, on oligarchs, that doesn't rely on uh, being a rogue state with respect to uh, dealing in nuclear weapons or, or hacking uh, every, everybody in the world. Other comments? I just say that you should look at a state like Azerbaijan for this. Um, in the sense, they're not a perfect analogy to the, to the Soviet Union or Russia or anything, but they have been a world oil producer. Baku was an oil producer in the 19th century and the mm -hmm. early 20th, and they're now at a point where their national strategy is to look at the change to natural gas and then ultimately to go beyond carbon. And yet they have a lot of these problems of uh, a corrupt oligarchy, uh, you know, a, a set of bad governance things. And I think that's an interesting, maybe Kazakhstan too, are, are states to watch about um, when, when, the, when, the, when the tap runs out. I think the Arctic does, and, and even new technologies, will make the carbon area last a little bit longer than, than, than we thought, uh, just because I worked for somebody at the Carnegie Endowment who thought by 2015 there would be no carbon left. Um, she's retired um, <laughs> to enjoy her prescience. Um, but I think, so there's a kind of a shock or surprise, but I do think there are some oil states that are coming to the end of their um, I mean, Azerbaijan right now sees, you know, the next 10 years, their, their, their oil has gone down and their natural gas has gone up and they're, they're going to have to struggle with some of these same, in a, in a mini, miniature way that the, the Putin regime or the, the successor might have to go through in the next 30, 40, 50 years. Okay. I'm going to come to the middle here. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, Perhaps I'm not the only one whose head is spinning at trying to understand your four different academic perspectives, but all the perspectives of all of these surrounding countries, about which I'm quite ignorant. Um, but um, my confusion would uh, be dissipated somewhat if you could use uh, or explain what a couple of um, acronyms have to do with it. I know what a GDP is, but not the FDI and not CIS countries. And also, I know that IMF probably stands for the International Monetary Fund. No, INF, I'm sorry. Oh, then, then I'll give you a chance to talk about that. Inter intermediate Nuclear Force Agreement. Sorry. The other ones were at leases. <laughs> right, okay. right. So I, I saw several of my students in the audience, so I apologize for not having gone straight to what those uh, acronyms mean. So um, GDP is gross domestic product, and it's just the size of the economy. FDI is foreign direct investment. And you were asking, did you say I, CIS, oh, um, the Commonwealth of Independent States, which are the, uh, the countries that used to belong to the Soviet Union. Okay, uh, who's got the mic, okay. So I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't ask a question to two of my former professors on the panel. But I am, so there was comment that um, with Russia interfering in our elections, no matter if it was Republican or Democrat and par partisan politics aside, um, we know that the Russians want to tamper with our fear and you know, into our, our natural you know, democracy in itself. And so I guess my question is, um, if it's not elections, then what is the potential for Russia to um, tamper with our infrastructure, whether that's our energy, whether that's our um, data infrastructure in itself? Um, you know, we talk a lot about how oil and whatnot is driving um, the economy, but is there interest in growing uh, capacities for Russians to develop a mindset for um, computer engineering, perhaps, and trying to mastermind um, our United States infrastructure in that regard? Okay. 
I'll, I'll quickly uh, start. So um, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a really good question, too. We don't know what the problem was with all of these nuclear submarines that were having this, these accidents this summer. This is highly unusual. So uh, somebody's going to tell me, I believe, in a year or two that these were all hacked and that we did something silly, like had passwords like admin or 1234 <laughs> for, these, uh, for getting into their computer system. So yes, we, we should be really concerned about our infrastructure, especially our critical infrastructure, and certainly our military, in face of what Vladimir Putin has stated about the future of artificial intelligence. Now, he's stated something that was nuanced. So he's, he's skeptical of autonomous decisions being made about using, say, nuclear weapons. But he understands that there are enough uh, Russians who've done a good job of hacking and using artificial intelligence that this could be harnessed. What he's also said is that he would, you know, all nations need to, uh, to research this and that information would be shared by Russia just as, it, as, and he added this in the press conference, just as it is being shared about nuclear technology. I was like, well, okay, nobody's gonna hold your breath about that, right? So there's not being information shared about that. But I think that, that at, at several levels, we're not taking seriously at many, many different points in, in business and industry, and, um, and certainly with respect to intellectual property, but with respect to uh, national security, we're not taking this as seriously as, as we might. We're, we're the ones who need to take this seriously. When President Obama said in 2012 that we're looking for a Sputnik moment, I mean, we, we should have taken up that mantle. That, that's, not, that's, that's not abstract. We really do need to cultivate these resources. And it's not making every single person an engineer. It's not turning all of you wonderful students of, of mine who are budding economists, right? <laughs> right, into engineers, right? It, it, it is making sure that we have the resources to be able to do that, whoever's interested in it. So, so I think we haven't taken this as, serious, uh, as seriously as we should in many different sectors and, and many different realms of society. I didn't know that there were budding economists. I thought they always came fully formed, that they didn't have to, to uh, go through any earlier stages. Right? Uh, who has? Oh, Matt has a comment. I just say that Russia's already done this in relation to Ukraine, right? Russian hackers have disrupted the en energy infrastructure of Ukraine and, and destroyed its banking system for a single day, so it has the capacity to do this. It also employs decidedly low-tech means, so um, <laughs> uh, uh, if you watched Russian news, they'd often feature the same woman in multiple locations in Ukraine um, uh, begging for Russian um, uh, support for separatist initiatives, but it's the same woman appeared in Odessa and Donetsk and Luhansk, so it was clearly an actress who, who was set up to, <laughs> to, uh, to contrive that sort of ploy. Um, uh, they also are very stupid, if I might say that, in regards to technology as well. So one of the reasons, or one of the ways, sophisticated ways that Ukrainian um, tech-savvy people have proven a Russian presence uh, is to uh, simply look at their social networking posts, so, right, by soldiers who've been Russian soldiers who've been operating in Ukrainian territory and uh, and locating where they were in, in Ukraine. So um, uh, there, the technological means uh, that soldiers are employing in order to remain connected with their family and relatives, but something that the Russian government didn't see it fit to prevent. Uh, it sort of exposes the reality of what's gone on in southeastern Ukraine. Other uh, comments? Okay. All right, we're going to come here to the middle. Hi, uh, my question is mostly for uh, Professor Polly. You had mentioned that um, uh, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine is one that Russia seeks to um, see more as like a cultural and um, I guess irredentist conflict in part. 
Um, but also when you overlay the infrastructure of like oil pipelines and gas pipelines coming out of Russia into most of Western Europe, the majority of those uh, pass through Ukraine. So I suppose my question is, especially when we look at linguistic maps and political maps of Ukraine as to how the last election went, who voted for who, um, what do you think that the future of especially Eastern Ukraine is going to be? Do, we, do you think that you'll see more um, of a Crimea situation where the East starts coming more towards Russia? Or um, I suppose what's your, and I suppose for anyone on the panel, uh, where do you see the future of Ukraine going? Uh, so are you talking about the occupied part of Ukraine? Yeah. What is the future of the occupied part of Ukraine? Yeah. Uh, I think that's uncertain, certainly. Um, what the Minsk agreements are trying to force Ukraine to do is accept what Russia calls the federalization of Ukraine, whereby um, these two particular provinces, or oblasts, have special status within Ukraine. Uh, they can conduct their own foreign policy uh, with Russia and other states. Um, and they're trying to work that into the agreement so much that that Ukraine accepts, uh, in fact, a, a de facto independence for these these areas. Um, uh, you know, time will tell. Uh, I think that you know there has been massive human flight from these territories. So the people that remain there are people who are pretty committed to the current status quo. That is a really strong relationship to Russia. That doesn't mean that there aren't many people from those two areas that are now resident in Kiev and other uh, places in Ukraine uh, who have a very different view of those places. But those are young, young people, ambitious people, people who saw no particular future in those regions. So um, uh, the economies of those two regions, uh, Lisa can speak to this better than I, will depend on patronage from Russia uh, uh, Russia is trying to make Ukraine pay, I'd say, <laughs> for the for the devastation that Russian actions have caused uh, in these territories. But uh, in the short term, uh, they will depend on subsidies from Moscow, and of course, use the ruble presently in order to conduct business. Okay. We've got a few questions over here. Hi there. Thank you. Um, so I was curious about. Um, as the Arctic Sea does thaw and more areas for um, oil do pop up, um, I've heard that Russia is starting to set up new bases along their polar regions. Um, and this brings to thought, what would it take for Russia to become, um, to reach the level of uh, the Soviet power it once was, to be an actual threat once again to the US? And do you think if it were to reach that point, would it try to once again resume Cold War tactics um, against the United States? Thank you. You know, I just don't, I don't think they're headed there. I think they're in the Arctic for the reasons uh, Professor Cook suggested. I think they're there ahead. They need this influx. Um, I still haven't seen um, a place where they've confronted a peer power and stood toe to toe. They're very cautious about China. If this were a different U.S. regime, I, I think they would be backing away in certain areas. So um, I don't think they want to become the Soviet Union again, and I think it would be a grave mistake for us to think that. I do think there's plenty of problems and chaos and confusion and, 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 and just frustration of our interests from what, what you've got. What I would look for and this is one thing that the Cold War gives you. you, you can see a kind of model of serious military planning, deployment of troops um, from the conventional all the way to the nuclear, and I think we know what a organized force, it would have to change for the 21st century, but I think we know what an organized force that would be in that class would be, and I think we would observe it. To me, one of the most interesting things is they've adopted a nuclear doctrine that looks like NATO from the 1960s. In other words, it's a kind of admission that they're not going to get back to the, their conventional superiority. They've, um, they're doing a bunch of things that make me nervous and would re-nuclearize relations, but fundamentally, I think they, um, and I think, by the way, this is related to, more to China than to us. I think they have a doctrine that says we're not going to match you, but we're free, like NATO said in the 60s and 70s, that they're free to use nuclear weapons um, if they feel that the circumstance warrants. So I think it's, it, it, I don't think they're headed there. I think they're headed to 
being a kind of important power in their region, a selectively, a selective player elsewhere. They want back into the halls of power and all of that. And I think, um, but one thing that, to me, if I were sitting in the Kremlin, the thing that would worry me most is that speech that was given in China uh, 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 just a week ago by the leaders that they're, they've done a lot more to be friends with China, but fundamentally that kind of Chinese power, if it succeeds, is not just military, it's economic, it's cultural, it's, it's soft power, it's the 21st century uh, power. And Russia can't compete with any of that. And maybe we're not going to be able to compete with it, but it is something where um, I, I think that they have a, a concern there. But if you look at ever since there was a leak in the late 90s where the defense minister complained that the threat assessment didn't take China seriously enough and there was such a suppression of that, no, that's wrong. I don't think they've said anything negative about China in 17 years. I mean, there are small think tanks that do, but no, they're, they're the best buddies. And so I think it's important to step back and see, not only it will add to these descriptions of Russian power, it's also schizophrenic. I mean, I think, and by the way, I think some of their militarization and their rhetoric towards the West, which is very serious and we should take seriously, is also something that allows them to expand military capacities that they might need in the East. Okay, we have another question right over here. So, um, what what struck me, Matt, about your talk was yeah, about Ukrainians. That the, he thought that language, the language map, wasn't as definitive as like we like to understand it. Oh, the east, those that look towards the east, those look towards the west. It's a simple explanation. But and I guess this is where I want to combine some of the units and talk a little bit about culture or nationalism. I mean, I think you know, like look at what. You know, Sherm said about, you know, the people support Putin as long as the regime's giving them what they want, but it's not excessively culture, you know, it's not about specifically nationalist. Yet, you know, one of the things I've learned that these areas of the world are more ethnically non-Russian or Russian, or Russia is more ethnically Russian than ever before. I know the Caucasus are more ethnically Georgian, Azerbaijani, Armenian than ever before. It sounds like I know the Baltic states, and I know Lisa and I saw it in Estonia, you know, that clearly the Russian minority was pushed out. So does culture, ethnicity, nationalism play a role anymore? And is it, and for me, that would seem to be one of the most different things than the Soviet era, where when the Soviets you had a very aggressive style when it came to suppressing subnational or ethnic nationalism. Um, and so, you know, to what degree? Does any of that really matter? Because I, again, I saw it from, that's why I said, I guess I wanted Matt to kind of continue a little bit on that notion that maybe it wasn't linguistic, because you know, it's something else. Um, so that's where I'll leave it. So thanks, Matt, um, for an opportunity to expand. <laughs> Always a privilege. Uh, because we say these things quickly and, and we like to say more. Uh, in, in regards to Ukraine, what I meant specifically is that uh, that many of the protesters on the Maidan uh, were speaking Russian. And most of the soldiers involved in what the Ukrainians call the anti-terrorist operation, the ATO, or Russian-speaking Ukrainians. Um, uh, there's a danger of hyper-Ukrainian nationalism, as you probably well know, uh, but I would say that's not what motivates, mm, integral nationalism doesn't motivate most Ukrainians in defiance uh, of what Russia has done to Ukraine. Um, uh, Russians, the Russians intended uh, in many ways for the, their actions to uh, invite a referendum on the Ukrainian uh, state or the Ukrainian, the victors of, of the 2014 overthrow of Viktor Yanukovych, um, and it hasn't been that. Most Ukrainians have united around 
um, resistance to what is going on uh, in eastern Ukraine, and people, I guess, are more a little a little more nuanced regarding Crimea. But but Crimea, most people accept that it's never going back. But that is not a good thing. That's in Russian hands. Um, in regards to Russian nationalism, I mean, I, I think nationalism has some role, but it's a I can't really sort out Russian nationalism quite honestly. It's this strange hybrid of homage to the Soviet Union and to the imperial past at the same time which I suppose was always present in Soviet history as well, particularly during the Second World War and other points in Soviet um, history. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I've argued, I suppose, in other places that a lot of what has happened in southeastern Ukraine is about a contested memory of the Second World War. Right, um, and I suppose that's an element of a particular form of maybe not nationalism but Soviet patriotism that um, that uh, that still imbues the Russian the Russian state. So um, they're able to uh, foment um, public opinion against Ukraine by suggesting that fascists are in charge of Kiev um, by pointing to um, a uh, collaborationist Ukrainian nationalist organization that was predominantly in Western Ukraine, has very little to do with the present government uh, in, uh, in Kiev. Um, and then the separatists wear this um, uh, order of victory that was handed out in the Second World War, right? So they're the, they're the inheritors of Soviet victory in the Second World War, and in part, I think that, that motivates. Um, in other words, Russia, in the end, is the sole legitimate um, successor to everything good that might be uh, salvaged from the Soviet experience, and other states do not have that claim. Let me just ask uh, Kyle and others to, to jump in, not only on the nationalism issue, but the one thing, the, the one word that has not come up yet tonight on this panel is Islam mm -hmm. in relation to um, you know, Islamic uh, both neighbors on the one side and, and minorities as well within the Russian state. Any comment on not only the nationalism, but also that lay on of, of religion? Uh, because we heard about Orthodox Christianity coming back. Naturally, uh, sometimes that can create Islam as a strong foil uh, within the Russian state, perhaps. Any comment, Kyle, on Islam? Uh, Islam, uh, I think when you're looking at it, has uh, in some cases been uh, a major challenge for Moscow if, if we're looking at different manifestations of it, but it's not a necessary impediment by any means. And again, I would I would look at the uh, relationships that you have between Turkey and and, and Russia in that case. Uh, you, you have uh, a state uh, led essentially by uh, neoliberal Islamists in Turkey, uh, but there's no friction uh, over that particular issue. Uh, when, it, when it comes to, to dealing with Russia. Uh, there had been some challenges uh, before about particular sects within uh, the, the sort of political fold in, in Turkey, but they've, they've fallen out within Turkey as well uh, recently, and it's uh, been more of a, a sort of question of uh, political uh, influence rather than of religion or religiosity. Okay, other comments? I, I just wanted to say a bit about ethnicity and uh, national identity, and I think it's a really interesting question that, that we saw sort of firsthand when we were in Estonia, and I think that one element of this stronger uh, national identity and, and the sense of heightened sense of ethnicity comes from this much larger neo-Nazi movement that has been, it's not, it's not even underground. I mean, it's, and, and uh, when you and I were there, uh, certainly we found out about a, a number of neo-Nazi groups that had moved from Idaho and other places in the United States and fed on this uh, lack of certainty and lack of attachment to the global economy that was changing very quickly, that had English as its uh, dominant power, say, on the internet. And these young people who were uh, much more interested in being 
on uh, or g gaining access to Netflix or being on Facebook and being able to speak English and participate in the new economy uh, than their parents were because they were nostalgic about something that was, was slow moving, broke up, and they feel uh, humiliated by it. And I think this is what Putin is tapping into. And I think this is what the neo-Nazis are, are tapping into there, just as they are here. Okay. We've got a question in the front here. Okay. Hey. Okay. Uh, sorry. So I've been like listening this whole time, and I've been trying to form this question. Um, so it kind of comes back to influence uh, and where we are in the 21st century. So we know like we see all these nations vying for power in the Arctic region um, to get those resources. We see the soft power that's kind of playing out there with the militarization, or not militarization, but like the mm, putting up of uh, bases there with uh, anything. So my thing is like. Is there going to be more in the 21st century? Is there going to be less uh, proxy wars based on this ideology of um, us versus them, or is it going to be more so like economically based? Are sanctions going to be more um, prevalent in this new global globalized world where you can defend your ideology like that, or is it going to be more militarized? Because I feel like there's not going to be a, a power that can go head to head with each other um, just because it's like certain doom for everyone. So is there, is it going to be more towards a push of like economic sanctions or no? Does that make sense? Uh, so if I can take a quick stab at this, I think that as is the case during the czarist period, um, Russia doesn't like to talk about the economy unless it is in service of national security and of the military and of military power. So Russia did not go on the gold standard in the 19th century willingly, but only because they saw this as a way to be able to compete, to become more internationally uh, competitive, to be able to sell their wheat and therefore to have enough money to fight the wars they wanted to fight. I think that's still true. I think that's, I, I really think that's still true. Putin does not care what an objective function is or what like a production possibilities function, he, he does not care. He cares that he has some oligarchs he can control because he is the one protecting their stash, which is ultimately his stash. So. Reportedly, he's the richest person on the face of the earth. He's the richest person in the world. And that's because he has pots of money stored with people. He is protecting them. And I think that this, I don't think that he sees a difference between the two. And I think that these are, are tactics he's employing to protect economic power or, or wealth, just as there are tactics to protect uh, national security. I don't think there's a grand strategy, like uh, Sherman is saying, I don't, I don't think there's a, a grand strategy. So I think going forward in the 21st century, especially in the Arctic, I don't think that's gonna change anything. Now, I think from the US perspective, I think that there is a greater urgency to sign the Law of the Sea Treaty, which we haven't done, because Russia is, is proposing its uh, it's, it's, let's call it its sphere of influence or its claims, its uh, legal claims to the Arctic, and it's just taking them to the UN, just as is Canada, just as Denmark, just as is Norway, and like they're, they're almost in a sense playing fair, and we're not even at the table, right? So I think that, that they may be able to just sort of to run the Arctic because we, we have decided that we're just disinterested. And I think that's a dangerous position. And this isn't just with this administration. I mean, we haven't signed it yet. We've been trying to get this signed for a long time. And it was about to be signed, um, let's say, at, in sometime in 2012. But, uh, but, that, uh, but that was fleeting. But I think it is important for us to, to be at the table. And I think that there is much more consensus about this among uh, uh, Congress people in the United States. Can I, can I just say one, one thing? I mean, I, I think that 
I remember looking at all this literature about the growing closeness and technological connections in the world and the economic interdependence, and at the same time, if you read stuff that came out of the Pentagon, or there's a famous French defense intellectual who wrote about the rosy future of war, I mean, I think we're, it's always a battle about what, um, what means are going to be used and what's going to dominate. And the idea, I, I just have never believed that external conditions make war impossible or anything else. And that's why I think, you know, it's, it's really important right now that a, a, an entity like the European Union or an entity like the United States of America and its allies and everything, which, again, is certainly not bereft of power and influence and bad dealings and everything, but we, those, those folks don't fight one another. And I think to undermine our faith that these institutions, economic and political and even security ones, can't work, can't respond to this, and uh, I think that's a great danger to assume that we're too closely related to, or you know, we'll lose profits if this happens or that happens. I mean, look how close to real danger we are in the Korean Peninsula. Look how close we are to real danger in many parts of the world. And it seems to me that at, this is the worst time of all for the United States of America to lose faith in its own system and itself and to lose connections with our allies. My God, this is one of the, for all of its problems, it's one of the great structures that created a, a more interdependent economy, a global trading system, a, some sense that there ought to be rights for everybody, even if we've stamped on that at times. And I think if you thought of the worst possible time to be nationalist, it's right now. It is absolutely right now. And so if you want a kind of a world in which a bunch of Sorry, Lisa. Boring economists argue about regulations. I want that world. I don't really want to have much to do. Well, we, we have to really live up to our institutions, which includes our security institutions and our extension of, you know, this security umbrella and to be a serious uh, ally to people. Because the world is dangerous anyway, by the way. There's a lot of things that could happen outside of our control, but to sort of let this roll away um, I, I think I recommend going to read this book, Rosie, Future of War. I think that is a potential out of this mess um, that we should be really trying to avoid. And we should certainly want the European Union to be as strong as possible because this double Europe that Russia wants, their side of Europe will not be a pretty one. It's not going to be run by uh, goods for all for economic opportunity, new technologies, um, the bright, the so-called the communists always talked about the bright future. It is not going to be a bright future there. And so the hard boundary between our Europe and their Europe is exactly what we should have wanted to avoid in the last 30 years. And that's exactly, I think, where we're, we're headed. We're, we're going to take question. a few more questions right over here. Yeah, we got a question over here and a couple in the middle, yeah. and I think we can wrap it up. So. I think we're going to be talking about Russia and our elections for the coming years. Do you think that there's a potential to see a shift in the rhetoric around um, candidates running for the presidency after Trump or, you know, in 2020, 2024, um, that will look closer to sort of a Cold War view on Russia and pushing towards that policy as sort of a retribution? Or do you think that the current sort of ambivalence about Russia is sustainable? Do you think it will be a platform that people will run on? Um, or do you think it may be even trying to pull Russia more into the fold, even if Russia necessarily just kind of wants to create chaos? Look, I think we should defend ourselves from this. So if we can't admit that they, they did certain things and that lots of people want to do it, the North Koreans went into the Sony studio, all of that stuff, we have to defend ourselves. Is it worth defending? Because the Russians aren't trying to take over the United States. And so I've also fought against, you know, just 
knee-jerk Cold Warism because I saw the Cold War. I worked in the Cold War. I understand, but this isn't it yet, and I don't think we're headed there, frankly. So, yeah, I think there's a danger from both sides. We get into a kind of a strange silence about this and not defend ourselves and not see, uh, Lisa very well answered this earlier, I mean, our power structures are vulnerable, not to just to the Russians, to the Chinese, to the to hackers that want to, like this blackmail stuff that close mm -hmm. your computer, mm -hmm. all of that. So there's a whole range of forces of chaos. And I, uh, I just think if we're going to have this kind of society that is open and soft and everything, it also has to have a kind of hard edge too. So uh, can we defend our own democracy? Do we believe in it? Are there certain facts that we agree on even if we disagree on their ideological interpretation? Can we listen to one another about different voices? I mean, in a way, Russia, this is, goes back to a Lincoln speech, but you know, they don't have to take us over if, if the answer to that is no, that, that we can't live together, we can't figure out, we, we, it's, this is our political notion of citizenship has become a racial or a, or a nationalistic notion. We've lost, to me. So all this fancy security stuff won't matter if we can't sustain ourselves. And that's the big, I would say that's the number one strategic challenge. And I don't think Washington's doing a very good job on that right now. But I also think a lot of us have seem to have lost faith in that challenge. But it needs to be renewed, because you can't do this other stuff I'm talking about if you don't know who you are, you don't want to defend your system, you don't believe our system. Um, can recover, you don't believe we can do all of these things. So I think that's important. Stephanie, I have a request. If you would take the, the that question and then the two up here, just in a row, and then have the panel uh, uh, react to them, that'd be great. So uh, my question is, under the Obama administration, we kind of got used to um, countering Russian aggression with sanctions and mostly economic sanctions. And I'm just curious, what can we do beyond sanctions to um, counter Russian aggression, whether it's interference in elections, civil conflict, or um, social issues? Um, and would one way kind of be to authorize the US, or the US authorization of deployment of like lethal aid to Ukraine? Um, so that's my question. Okay, then we had a question right here, Stephanie, and over to John here. Hi, thank you for coming to speak with us today. Uh, so the Obama administration was characterized by an increase in the number of drone strikes in countries such as Yemen, Pakistan, and other countries. But I wanna know if Russia views the increase in drone strikes as a threat to its national security. Okay, then over to John. Oh, um, Russia is our, whatever else Russia is, it's our neighbor. Uh, it has about one-fifth of the world's dry land. Uh, even if you can't see it from, uh, f really see it from Alaska, we are neighbors. But what can we do to be better neighbors, to get closer, to uh, not think of it, think of each other as enemies anymore. I'm glad we got, toward the end of the discussion, we got into uh, more about what, what we can do and how we look at our own system. Uh, really, it would mean that be nice, I think, if uh, we could help the Russians be more democratic and the Russians could help us uh, socialize our industry more. <laughs> so why don't we do this? Why don't we start with Lisa and, and then move down the panel? So answer any of the three questions or comments that you want to uh, pick up on, please. Then what we'll do is uh, you know, any other comments that you want to make, and we'll simply go across the panel. And that way, uh, bring it to a conclusion. Lisa? OK, so your question again was about Sanctions, right, right, okay. So I think that that has been an incredibly powerful tool. 
And I think that the European Union has been very cautious about imposing them because they, they could be retaliated and they are so dependent on uh, Russian oil and gas, for example, that this would be, uh, this could be detrimental to their economy. But the IMF estimates that this has resulted in a 1.7% decrease in GDP for Russia in the period between uh, 2014 and, and now. So I think they're working. I mean, I think that's the best we can hope for any uh, sanctions. And this is, this is, I think, what is motivating, uh, is, a, is a chief, not the chief, motivating factor for Putin. These sanctions are working. They're biting. Um, they don't have, the assets have been frozen. They don't have access to all of these billions they've stashed away in every single part of the, the, the world. So I think that's a tool that we still have. We have to use it cautiously, though, because our partners who will help us enforce it are in the European Union. So I, I think that as long as the European Union stays, stays strong, uh, these will continue to be uh, useful for, for us. Beyond that, you know, just trade. Every, you know, why did Russia have spies at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, you know, as students, right? I mean, I think that there's something about sort of the way the U.S., and what, what they're learning is how to run organizations, organizations including uh, government. And I think that this is something that you can't emulate just by looking at it, right? So I think that we still have um, an advantage. Well, th they're admitting that we have some sort of advantage by having universities that are open, supporting public universities. A lot of their universities are not being supported like they were in the Soviet Union. The arts aren't being supported like they were during the Soviet Union. So I think that there is a lot that they uh, think about us as being models for, but I think that there are ways that we can put uh, pressure uh, on them. I'll just uh, say a bit about how we can be uh, friends, why, why we can't be friends and how we can be friends. I think that, you know, we have people on the space station, you know, there are Americans on the space station hanging out with Russians every day, so there are some ways in which we're still cooperating, and I think that happened during the Cold War too. So what uh, my research shows is that for you know, Russians obtained uh, Soviet residents, uh, Soviet inventors obtained a lot of patents in the United States during the Cold War. And this was something when I presented this in, um, uh, in Moscow, the university in Moscow, this is something that a lot of people didn't know who were alive during that period and these were their counterparts. There is a lot, of, and that had to happen because of cooperation with scientists in the US. So I think that that's how we continue to break down barriers, uh, cultural alliances. And I, I, I don't like the dichotomy of soft power versus hard power, because one connotes like it's somewhat useful, and then there's like, like mommy, daddy, ask, you know, I, I don't like that dichotomy. I'm just saying that a lot of things can be effective. And if that can be effective, we can, we can use it. It was effective during the, uh, during the Cold War. All right, a lot of thoughts. I, I'd agree with Lisa that the sanctions regime has surprisingly held. I didn't expect it to. I expected there to be much more disagreement over the course of time between the EU and the United States and really between Germany and France who, who, who drive these decisions for the EU. Um, uh, I'd also say it's surprising in, in spite of my <laughs> own shared criticism of the current administration's view towards uh, Russia, that uh, it, it hasn't really changed policy on the ground. Um, so there's a U.S. envoy in charge of Ukrainian negotiations or a representative uh, for future negotiations on Ukraine who's pretty tough on Russia, a gentleman by the name of Kurt, Kurt Volker, um, who doesn't share this view that uh, one can immediately jump into friendship uh, with the Putin administration over over what uh, because of what's happened in Ukraine and, and I think Tillerson uh, at least on this question seems to be State Department still um, uh, driving 
driving policy on the ground. Uh, regarding lethal aid to Ukraine, that's just something I've thought about. And honestly, my, my gut reaction is that's not a good idea, right? That it just invites an escalation of the conflict. Um, but I do think what the U.S. has done to date has been good. What NATO has done to date has been reasonably good in terms of training the Ukrainian army to be a much more professional army than it was um, when the conflict first broke out in 2014, where you really had irregulars, paramilitaries um, operating uh, and, uh, and, and inflicting most of the damage, but also um, uh, in a sort of decidedly disorganized fashion when faced with the reality of true Russian supported uh, military activity collapsed, right? Um, it's just not the same military force anymore. I guess I'd be tempted, I'm not a military expert, but I'd t be tempted to say that, that NATO needs to do more to make consideration of any deeper incursion into Ukraine uh, a very dangerous decision to make. So what the Russian army has been good at is attacking and then running away, right? This is not an army of occupation by any means, and if they had to do that, they could risk losing the support uh, of the residents of Donbass, and they're not prepared to do that. So we need to make sure that there's a considerable cost for considering that sort of thing. Drone, act, drone strikes, I don't see that happening. I mean, I don't just, that's just way too risky of a, a thing to do. Lastly, uh, on the question of how to become friends, again, I, I of course welcome cultural exchanges and, and I have good friends in Russia and elsewhere. Um, uh, and on a very human level, uh, friendships persist. It's just uh, hard for me to see it with the current current uh, administration in, in Russia, to be frank. Um, uh, much of Russian foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the United States is motivated by rejection of what they felt was the moralizing uh, project of democratization of the 1990s, right? So that's not something um, that um, uh, invites necessarily um, uh, amity uh, in the future for their, for their American support for democratic expression in Russia. Kyle? Uh, I, th I think with <clears throat> I, I think when you look at the uh, question of sanctions, uh, you know, uh, they, they have been very useful, but they're not absolute, obviously. Uh, I, I think just like when uh, the U.S. Uh, you know, was dismissive of Erdogan after uh, 2013, he turned to Russia more. Uh, you saw a lot of those sanctions uh, functioning the same way, turning uh, Putin towards uh, alternative relationships uh, that they had, you know, particularly with Turkey. Uh, and. Uh, sometimes uh, th those kinds of developments are, are ones that um, we should probably think through a little bit more uh, ahead of time. W when you had the uh, uh, rejection of uh, uh, not just uh, uh, trade in uh, energy resources, but in you know things like foodstuffs and that sort of thing, uh, Russia simply turned to Turkey to start buying things. You know, just in the last couple of weeks, you know, it was, it was headline news in Turkey that. Uh, Russia was going to be buying more tomatoes in the in the coming year. Uh, the 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 kinds of um, uh, sanctions that we can impose are only as good as uh, our alliances are, and if we're not maintaining those with uh, countries like like Turkey that are uh, on the edge uh, of Russia, uh, that are, that are easy um, partners for them, uh, they're, they're not going to be as uh, effective, I think. The most successful diplomatic thing I was ever involved with was um, the denuclearization of Ukraine. And it started out with a lot of people thinking we were going to beat the country into a kind of submission and force them to do the right thing. And a couple of people that I really respect laid out two different visions, one that could lead to greater cooperation and more positive outcome, but also a harder one that said, if you're not going to move in this direction, we're going to actually take certain steps. And so I think we're at a point where we have laid out on the Russian side a whole set of things that are quite negative. Um, and are we willing to hold on to the sanctions? Are we willing to stand behind our allies, even say that NATO still matters? Uh, I don't know about the lethal aid to Ukraine, but I do think 
uh, what Matt said is quite right. I don't know what will happen to Crimea and eastern Ukraine, and there may even in the long run be some sort of territorial reorganization of the former Soviet Union, but we can't allow Ukraine to be, uh, the whole of Ukraine to be absorbed. Um, but that isn't just a U.S. decision. That's a decision about, that, that relates back to something that happened in the 90s too. What we wanted to do as we expanded NATO and expanded the EU was to make the boundaries between those organizations and non-members less significant. I don't see where that's a bad vision. I don't know how you get back there anymore. But the alternative is, if the boundaries are hard and the military stuff is serious, it's hard to defend the Baltics. If we're fighting with Turkey, it's hard to have an effective NATO. So are we serious about um, laying out, even for this Russian regime, a set of positive things that one could do um, to decelerate these movements towards a hard boundary? There's a hell of a lot of medical and environmental and other things we could actually do. Um, there's also, how do we get them out of the, how do we reverse the Magnitsky Act? Um, what would they have to do to make that happen? Um, somebody ought to tell them. Because if we get to a politics that in 2024 and 2028 is just, I'm going to be tougher than Russia than the next guy, I don't think Russia's that important to make that the turning the fulcrum of our politics. I think it's something where we could lay out a vision of a less divided Europe, one that sort of respects, I mean, Putin ruined my book on Ukraine, by the way. I, I had a great book on Ukraine, and it, it isn't any good anymore. But to me, I thought it was possible to have a Western-oriented Ukraine that's still fresh, uh, friendly with Russia. I thought that um, one could have Russia and Ukraine moving towards the West in a certain way while we were respecting the fact that just like they ought to respect it we have interests in our, our, our region that shouldn't allow us to send Marines everywhere anymore. They have interests in Tajikistan and places that probably are more than, than us. Can we talk about some joint things, the, the, the fellow that raised the drones? There's a whole set of modern military questions that would be better off if we could get the Chinese and the Russians and others at the table to talk about how those are introduced, what the rules of the road are. So I just think we're at a point, it's weird in American politics because the Trump administration can't say anything about Russia, it can't do anything positive about Russia without proving somehow that it's, that it's corrupt. And yet I don't, I, there must be a way forward that's better than that. And I do think if you look at the nuclear stuff, the weapons of mass destruction disposal, nuclear prol proliferation, the future of nuclear conflict and, and, and dialing that down, there's a whole set of, there's a discussion that we could have, as Lisa said, about the law of the sea, right? We've been way too nationalist about it since, what, 1971 or 68 or whenever it was. So I think, I think there is a way, but somebody's got to have the guts to say, yeah, I think Russia should be resisted in Ukraine, but also I think we should talk to them. If you remember the Cold War, we did those things both. We threatened them, we have a nuclear deterrent, we opposed their propaganda. We did a bunch, but we also tried to create a diplomatic channel, a hotline of this or that. We, we had agreements on uh, atmospheric testing and limits of nuclear testing, and then we had a set of agreements that capped the arms race, sort of, and then started to go in the other direction. It would be a shame to lose that. I mean, the idea that we can't do anything, I mean, this isn't Stalin. I don't like him. But there's a lot of people I don't like. I mean, still you got to have a got to have a relationship. So I think there's still things to do with this, with the with Russia. I think it's a very tough time to argue it. But I would I would start arguing it now that, that all is not lost. One has to both show a kind of a we're going to get tougher if you continue to go in the wrong direction. But there's also some carrots at the end of this and. One of my colleagues at Carnegie used to say that, that there are a lot of problems in the world that, that, that are more complicated if we're on the wrong side with Russia and, and there are things that are easier if they're part of the dialogue. And I, I don't want to exaggerate their power now, but I still think that's true on a number of things.
So, first of all, let me thank all of you in the audience for coming tonight. We only do these and are successful with them because you come. And thank you also to the uh, MSU Alumni Association for bringing us an audience that's not in the room, that's out in the world uh, live streaming. And last but not least, let us thank this wonderful panel for, I think, a rather sparkling conversation about uh, being Russia. Thank you so much.